Uh, Brian, Brian Wood. Tell me who you are, Brian Wood. Brian Wood. Uh, <laughs> also known as Woody. To a lot of my friends and people who I've served with. And um, former frontline soldier, first time in the Princess of Wales' War Regiment. Brian Wood, MC. Yep. PWR. When did you get out? Been out five years now. Oh, mate, time flies. Time flies, Absolutely. isn't it? Absolutely flies. I, uh, mate, I really appreciate your time. I know, you, I know you're mega, mega, mega busy. So, the thing is, we've this. been meaning to do something together for a long, long time. And I've always said, I'm a man of my word. It's just, you know, it hasn't fitted our diaries when we wanted to do it. Now we can do something short. And then once we're together properly in the studio, then I'll definitely love to come on for longer. Together. Together. Okay, for longer. More, more sensual. Love However, that. Where did you serve when you were with PWRR? So I done two tours of Kosovo, which was good for me because it was both peacekeeper missions, but clearly within the British Army, we always train for the worst course of action. So it was good to get an understanding. It was sort of my foundations, really, of understanding what it was like to become a frontline soldier. Uh, and it was good experiences. I also saw... Um, few things which you know kind of have stayed with me shallow graves to name but a few because we went uh, to Kosovo and in two late 2000 2001 so you know they'd only been kind of I don't know maybe five of ag agricolas that's what that's what the operation name was operation agricola so there was still you know kind of a lot of tension seen a, you know, a few things shallow grave wise and then I also went back out there in 2002 and obviously seen so much of a difference with the whole restructure uh, the rebuild there was kind of you know, a lot a lot more de-escalation by then as well but like I said it was good for me to get out there as a young boy uh, to understand what it takes to to be prepared enough to go on operations yeah, I I, um, I didn't serve on Agricola, um, but that part of the world, they are fierce people, mate. And if they get a bee in their bonnet, you don't want to be in the middle of it. I've got a good, I've got a really close friend who's Serbian. She came on the podcast, actually. She's Serbian. She grew up, she grew up in Serbia at the time when we were bombing the hell out of them. Um, yeah, there's a, we should actually, when we do, um, when we do a HR podcast, we should talk about that, mate, if you'd be up for that. If yeah, no, definitely. Because... Like I said, I was, I was there for a year, you know, two different six-month tours. There was a lot of change. Um, I was in Podjevo, then I was in Pristina. So, you know, it was uh, interesting. Yeah. yeah, completely different to the other, other operational tours that I've done. But that really, like I said, it was my foundations to understand what it was like to, to go operational. Because I missed out on Northern Ireland because I wasn't old enough to deploy. I was still 17 when it was kind of coming to an end. So that was my first, you know understanding of ops really and then two tours of Kosovo and my last tour which was Afghanistan 2012. Okay yeah oh man I was out by the time I, I, I left in 2011 okay yeah we um we I, when we te when we speak the Civ part we speak like or we do a bit of public speaking or whatever we're doing and we and we we think back over our military careers and stuff we always tend to focus on the hard hit in um the sort of wow factor aspects of it and rightly so but i think one of the things that we we as ex-military do a lot when we're together uh, chatting we focus equally on the amusing stuff because some of the some of the stories and the anecdotes that we've got from 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 serving it mate i mean we've got you know people have millions of them don't they? and it, it's all, you always know that one person who, who, who remembers every single story under the sun <laughs> so on that thinking back over your time go on yeah I mean, a lot of it's black humour as well. A lot of it's kind of when you're exposed to certain events which you don't really know how to deal with, we're very good at putting a tiny bit of humour to release a lot of pressure because, look, we've a lot of people out there have done a lot and seen a lot. And it's in the moments where you can kind of characterise it, which can relieve a lot of pressure as well. And people look at it and go, how can you even make that a joke? But it's our way of kind of dealing with certain situations and it's really important that we main, maintain that and um 
you know, we, we've obviously got so many on, on patrol, lot of people doing river crossings and falling in with all their kit, but then their kit is so heavy, they're going under, but you leave them, you leave them a little bit to like struggle. And people are like, get in there after him. No, no, he'd be all right. And then it's like, when, he, when you know he's had enough, then you pull him out. Um, anything sticking in your mind? Like, anything sticking in your mind? Like amusing, amusing story? I've got, I'll tell you what, right? I've got a story and it was in its, um, and it's actually in the, in the book and it's not anything to do with serving with the lads. It's on my way to Buckingham Palace with my dad and my wife and my mum. So everyone's quite tense. I've never gone to Buckingham Palace before. I'm still a young boy, not really understanding what's going on, if I'm honest. Oh, the, night before, the night before, I'm recording a song in a studio with the Dooley brothers, right? This is was surreal, honestly. And then we get in my Corsa, a 1.2. That's all I could afford back in the day. 1.2, black Corsa, SXI. And I'm in my service dress. My dad is a former soldier, um, quite a fiery Scotsman. He's all uptight because it's his son, you know, we're going on this incredible, you know, journey together. And he's driving the car because I'm in my service dress. Dad's in this, this central London, stressed out because he doesn't know how to drive in London. So I'm telling him to calm himself down to a panic. He then starts to back chat me. So we start having a row. I said, Dad, get out the bus lanes because we're going to get fined. He's like, I tell you what, you keep on, I'll be pulling over in a minute and you can drive. I said, well, pull over then. Pull the car over and I'll drive. Sure enough, here, this is a bus <laughs> hour. He's pulled his car over in the bus lane and I'm committed now. So I can't say no, just calm it and we'll go. I'm committed. So I'm in my ammo boots, the whole works. I get out, he gets out, we then both switch places, I get in, I just to see the cars and the horns are going nuts. He's there, I'm like, right, let's go then. So I'm like, so rigid and focused to get myself there. We've not spoke to each other. I pulled up thinking, yes, I've only found the gates as well. So I didn't have to ask him for any directions. <laughs> gone in, for, like, I've gone in, but it was the wrong gate. I was like, <laughs> And they were like, no, you need to go around the other way. And I was like, anyway, we kind of, yeah, we had a bit of a laugh when, once we parked up, um, got out of the car, and it was just kind of, it was just a very random moment. Um, you know, both quite the characters. Stubborn. Stubborn, yeah. And um, we got there, but to be honest, Dad's kind of non emotional man as well. He's, he's, he's fiercely proud. Um, he, in my opinion, he's, he is actually without sounding you know too soppy but the man is 100 percent an inspiration to me and um and it's definitely i regard him as top of the tree for, for for inspirational wise and um he just as we walk in he said look you know i'm five foot eight but today i'm 16 foot nine i'm really proud of you son and he doesn't normally say that you know so to me it was like wow like he actually has got a heart um, <laughs> And he's getting a bit softer now. He's getting older with the grandkids and stuff. But it's just that was a real memorable moment um, for me, which always sticks in my mind. Amazing, and all, all, mate. Sometimes all the pressure of something like that, a day like that brings out brings out the best best in people at the end of it. And the worst. Absolutely, yeah, the story. absolutely, mate. Yeah. <laughs> so on that, then um, that's an amusing story to do with your service. Absolutely, going to Buckingham Palace, mate. And obviously, congratulations on the MC. Well deserved. Um, so. I normally ask, my next question I normally ask, I say normally, this is only the second snapshot I've done. I would yeah. ask, what, what, what has your toughest, toughest experience been? Now, it doesn't necessarily have to do with an operation, but I'm guessing, obviously you've got the book double-crossed, I'm guessing that your toughest experience was, was either that battle or it was the aftermath. So that's the question. What has been your tougher, toughest experience so far? Yeah, I mean, you're right. And it, and it wasn't the battle because I knew how to be a soldier. It was 100% the aftermath. And it was for a number of reasons. Uh, one, um, kind of being branded as a murderer, uh, committing like some barbaric war crimes, which never happened. That also getting traction and going up and out into the public domain. So you've got 
the BBC who are releasing Panorama on whose orders, which really smeared the British Army, my regiment, and clearly us who were involved, really bad. Made us out to be gross humans, and it just wasn't on. And then having to deal with the phone calls from family and friends asking me the questions: so Have I done it? Why are they, you know, why is the newspapers printing this? I mean, it really affected me so much so that that was the point where I needed to go and get some support because I was just overwhelmed. You know, I'd hidden all that trauma from from the battle, just parked it like a lot of us do. Didn't want to talk about it, just parked it all up. And once all of this came out into the public, it punished me in so many different ways that it brought everything back up because I was having to then read statements after statements after statements, having interviews all over it. So all of a sudden, I'm back on the battlefield again, but they're dissecting every movement, every word of command, every combat estimate that was spoken about on that battlefield. And I just can't shake it. And then I'm struggling to sleep. I'm worried sick because I'm just a normal guy. I'm only human. And when you're under so much pressure, everyone reacts differently. And for me, I just struggled to maintain focus. And um, 100%, it was the hardest thing to endure for doing something, I would say, overly brave. I know there's so many acts of bravery which have happened and continue to happen within the British Armed Forces. I get that. And I, I'm no different. But to then have that flip 360 and then all of a sudden you're kind of branded, like I said, as a, as a murderer, it, it punished me. And I never knew how to deal with it. I never knew how to deal with it because, you know, the Ministry of Defence, 100%, um, had lessons to be learned. They didn't support us. Um, that was very poor. No one asked to meet me, reassure me, um, kind of act as a bit of a ring of steel around us when we needed them most. I really needed someone to reassure me, but I never got that. And I, I highlighted that in the book and things I've got to change. And hopefully while other things are still happening with Northern Ireland, etc., that there is that family piece, that welfare piece that people are doing behind the scenes because no one done it for us. And my marriage suffered from it. Um, and also my, my, my mental health suffered from it because I was just kind of left and the other guys involved. It wasn't just me involved in this. Everyone else was in the same boat just kind of left to deal with everything what was going on around us. So, yeah, it was, it was a poor effort, but I've got a love affair with the military and I struggle to, you know, to say anything negative about them. But the bottom line is I'm also, you know, with my integrity and my values, I've got to bring that up. So hopefully it will make changes moving forward because it has to be done. It's mate. It is a it is a worry. I think things like with your case and with all you guys involved in that case, with Iraq and the, with da, with the Battle of Danny Boy and with what's going on with the historical allegations with Long Island at the minute, and it's always in the back of my head. No one's safe, and it and it's not. People think, oh, people may have this perception, or we're not military. You think, well, you only need to worry if you're guilty of something. It's not the case. It's not the yeah. case because you were a case in point, like you know, especially in terms of multiple tours in the Middle East, where you, the the people in the Middle East where we served, Iraq or Afghan, right? They're exploitable. They're vulnerable people. They're exploitable, which is exactly what the lawyers do and did by money for money for witnesses, money for statements, and it, and then they make a statement, and that, because they said it, the one that must be true. And then that time, and then and then all of a sudden you've got your situation, whereas and the same with Northern Ireland, and you know I don't think it's really hit Afghan yet that anything like that, but I think it's going to, and it's going to be another nightmare. It's going to be another nightmare. Um, it depends. It all depends on how, how these uh, historical allegations are handled going forward, and hopefully the Office of Veterans Affairs is going to play a hand in that. But it is a it is a worry now. Oh, I oh man. It must be the worst thing in the world to be in the position you were in and, you, and your mates were in. Horrible. I can't, I can't imagine it. And it, it is worrying. And people walk on their pins for it because of yeah, it. Yeah, um, I mean, Hugh, you know what it's like to be on operations and it's such a demand. And when you're under so much pressure with only a split second to get decisions made and also commit to them, 
no one can really understand it unless you've been in them situations. And it is so hard to then be in a dock, getting cross-examined by some very intelligent QCs who don't have the experience of battlefield or war fighting. It's, it was hard for me to, to accept what they were saying about me. It was hard to, for me to take when they were, they put my citation up on this, on the big screens in that, in that room, not to congratulate me. They pulled to pieces everything that was stated good about me in that citation about, really? yeah, about why I used you know, 15 rounds um, to eliminate you know, a, a target. And I was like, where does it stay about using the use of ammunition to eliminate a threat? Militia fighters. These are fighters who ambushed us. Tell me where it says that I, you know, over exaggerated that, you know, why are we even talking about this? You know, then they went at me because I never gave one of the um, Iraqis water in the back of the vehicle where I've just been fighting for four and a half hours. I get in the back of the vehicle trying to hydrate me and my lads after that day and because i never give um some of the iraqi detainees prisoner of war any water oh, the guy who's just been shooting at you. yeah never give them any water which i which i admitted because i never did because when he had a, a, a bottle left and you know i'm gonna look after my soldiers at the end of the day and i never did even though he's puckering his lips and he was asking for water and i've, I've actually admitted that saying so, yeah he was and i've been honest about that but I've only got one bottle of water. My other guys, three of them are on a, on a drip because to rehydrate themselves, and I've only got a bottle of water left, so therefore I'm going to use that for us because that's what I think is humane, looking after them. But they thought that was inhumane because I wasn't giving them any water. It, it's full in context, though. I, it's like, I, you know, on the flip side, if you were sitting there and you had a bunch of crates of water, mate, sitting on water everywhere, you'd hand them up. I know I would. I'd hand, them the, I'd hand the water over because I want them to stay alive to flip and punish the bastards. Yeah, sorry, pardon the, pardon the language, but I mean, but let's, I'm just conscious of time, mate. Yeah. How, how is this, how is the film coming along? Can we, can uh, we talk about it? Uh, yeah, I mean, we can talk about it, certain elements anyway. Look, it's going to be a major dramatisation. It's going to be a 90-minute feature on one of the main broadcasters, and if you put two and two together, you, you'll probably get it right, but I'm not going to, I can't, I can't verbally say it because it's not been, the press release hasn't come out yet, but I'm not very good at keeping secrets, but. Well, I'm a fan of Netflix. I mean, well, we'll see. I mean, it's, go it's going on to a huge main broadcaster. Like I said, it's going to be a 90-minute feature. So feature film. It's going to be that feature of the year. And um, the budget's in place. The budget's a punchy budget for it as well. So, you know, and also I'm, I'm involved in the consultancy. So if there is any military um, hiccups, then it's down to me. It's on my shoulders. So, uh Look, can I believe it? Of course I'm not. I'm just an ordinary guy like everyone else, mate, which has served their country. I, I would like to think I've made a small difference to, to, our, to our nation and um, to have this kind of come out the other end when 10 years ago I couldn't even see the hand in front of my face because my, my headspace was so foggy. Now I'll be in the clearest of headspaces, probably more driven now than I ever was, even in the military. And this has kind of come about, the book done really well, um, went into you know, the Sunday Times bestsellers at number three and number two but then i couldn't shift michelle obama but you know i can um i can accept that and then having the option for for the film and then having you know where we're at, at the moment is just waiting for a couple of signatures for casting everyone will know the casting it's unreal and uh then we go shooting so we start to film uh probably the end of spring which is incredible and then it's going to be out this calendar calendar year so Look. Oh, that's rapid. Yeah. yeah, it's rapid. They're not messing about. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's really exciting, mate. And also, and you are the first person other than, and I told you about secrets, then I'm not very good at keeping them. <laughs> Hence, I can't lie. So when people are asking me for stuff, going back to our Swedish, I can't lie. And I'm, I'm an honest guy. So oh, mate. it just stressed me out. But I'm actually going to be involved in another film as well, separate to... What I'm doing, which is, I, yeah, I just can't believe it. But that's kind of done, and we're moving forward with that. So yeah, I can't, I can't really understand what's going on at the moment myself. 
Woody the actor. Woody the actor, mate. Looking forward to it. Yeah, it's going to be sick, mate. It's going to be really cool. And, and like I said, I'm not one to gloat or anything like that because I've, I'm not like that's not in my genes. But it's the second film is going to really, I think, um, support, raise awareness and will be a good thing for veterans because I love giving back. And I, I, I like to think you know that by the stuff that I've, I've done in the past. And I know that you do. And I know that like what your stuff with Team Rubicon and what you're kind of doing with your podcast is it's really having these conversations. Like your last one, I think it was, when I watched um, you guys in that booth, I actually messaged you because I thought it was that, that the, content, the, the content was that powerful. I thought it's about the, about the stigma. One of your officers was on there. Oh, Dean, Dean Witten. Loved it. I thought it was great. I, I commented, I said, that is brilliant content because it will go and help other people. And that's what this is about. What we're doing now is about supporting other people, raising the awareness on subjects that they like to be spoken about. We're also, you know, trying to support the, the armed forces. And I'll be first person to answer any questions that people have got on joining the organization. I would always support that, regardless of what's happened to me, because I know it's an incredible belonging, the organisation. You're not going to get any better experiences. You travel the world doing something that you love. It's just brilliant. Um, but I know there's many out there, and I'll continue to be an advocate, and, I'll, and yeah, I'm passionate about it. Well, well, you just started, thanks for the kind words, you just started a podcast as well, haven't you? Yeah, I have, yeah. Yeah, I oh, have. Yeah. Go on. It's on the first one, actually. Um, it's called The Raw Edition. you find it? It's called The Raw Edition. The thing is, though, Hugh, I've, I've been on so many other podcasts and I thought, you know what, I wouldn't mind actually you know, sort of dealing my hand with it. And a business in London called Jones FM, we I had a meeting, I spoke to them, and they said, look, we want to, as a business, so no military ties, just a corporate business in London, but them as a business wanted to produce content for other people. Just produce content, whether it be military, whether it be um, business, whether it be sport. They just wanted to get someone, because they haven't got the time, get someone in to kind of run a podcast in partnership with Jones FM for other people. Because they're very selfless like that, but they're also producing, hopefully, some good takeaway um, points which will come out from from podcasts just to be different i mean they're in a sector that it's very much a facilities management sector that they know what they're doing day to day but they want to be a little bit different they want to have a little bit they want to have something else in their armory so i thought actually we'll send you know our podcast in partnership with myself out to some of their suppliers so do you know what when you come in yeah. listen to this so their suppliers are getting free content but actually when they listen to it they can relate to a lot of stuff you know, the first, the first podcast that I did was with a good friend of mine, Jay Baldwin. Double amputee, lost both legs in Afghanistan. And then just over a year ago, was diagnosed with cancer. I mean, how's your luck? That is, I can't even tell you how bad luck that is. But the boy just maintains, you know, focus, his drive. When it kind of, I don't even know how I would, would have reacted losing both of my legs, never alone having now to deal with, Full on cancer, which has kind of got hold of him quite bad at the moment. So, you know, this cancer is a disease that people, so many people can relate to. Everyone out there will have um, a link to cancer because it would have affected either someone close or a friend. You know, it's just that it's, it's that broad. So, when he comes in and speaks openly about the signs and symptoms, then when he was found out that he was like, how he dealt with that, you know, people can relate to that. So that's content where people go, go, actually, I've been feeling like that. Maybe I should go and get checked up. Or when he's going through his process of the rehabilitation, how he kind of kept himself moving forward. People can relate to that. The people can get and extract some of that inspirational stuff. So I thought to myself, you know what? You've actually done quite well there. Not because I'm hosting it and not because I was always wanting to kind of do a podcast. I just think that's, that's, that's pretty good what they're doing just outside thinking outside the box and they're producing content that they can go and give to suppliers so when they go and bid for a tender we'll go and try and seal a deal and they say actually what do you do different well we've just done this you know five episodes of the raw edition podcast sponsored by us and there's 
you know, the stuff that's to do with Jay Baldwin. There's, you know, the leadership podcast, which I'll, I'll then get on with someone and talk about the fundamentals of leadership. I'm not a leadership guru, but I've been in some situations and some planning of, of extreme, some cool extreme leadership methods. And hopefully I can pull that across. But anyway, I could just pull in a lot of decent content for them to be a little bit different in their genre. So anyway, if it works, it works. If it doesn't, then it's actually been quite cool to host a podcast and get people on that. I think it's great. That's cool, mate. No, it's cool. I'm glad. I was ch- when I saw it come up audition, I was chuffed to start. I it's going to be good. I haven't listened to that episode yet, though. I need, to, I need to do it. I need to do it. It's finding the time, but I know it's getting the time because everyone's... Well, I, I do a lot of driving, mate. I listen to podcasts in the car. Yeah. So I, listen, I listen in the car and, 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 it, and it works for me. Or if I'm... Yeah, I did that. But we got only a couple. I was about to say we've got a couple of minutes left. We haven't we've gone over time. So <laughs> tell me this: um, one piece of advice that you give uh, someone uh, getting out of the military now doesn't have to be the ultimate piece of advice. One that pops in your head. You've got to use your time wisely and choose the right um, second career because you've got to enjoy yourself. You're still young enough to go and have a second career, so something that you want to get involved in and you've got a passion for and what makes you happy don't just jump on you know and go out and, and do your close protections kind of stuff because it's a comfort zone you're so much better than that so much skill sets use it and use it wisely and spend your money wisely also yeah i, I agree i think get, get it. if you haven't got an immediate option to get a foot straight into that ideal second career get a job that's Gives you routine, gives you money in, and you use that time to exactly what you said. Understand what do you really, what do I really want to do? What career do I want to go into? Is that just... hmm? It's important. It's important to to be happy as well, Q. Right? I mean, the job's been factoring that. Yeah, it's a it is a big factor because it gets the best out of you. If you enjoy doing what you're doing, one hundred percent, you'll squeeze that extra five percent out because you don't mind so important um don't rush it your transition's difficult right we, i know we're going over we've gone over but the transition from that institutionalized bubble the structure the detail the clear direction that you're given every day to i call it the real world it does take a little bit of time to adjust to get used to it to find your identity again because we lose that when we come away from the military but with that unstoppableness attitude the kind of never quit stuff it definitely pays dividends definitely because you're worth it 100 percent, you're worth it and you've got to really hone in on what you've done and your experiences if you can then put it into you know your stuff that on your new journey you, you will definitely succeed i agree i agree 100 percent. but did you just throw a, a hair product uh tagline at me you're worth it is that not is that not is that not? That is, yeah, I'll, mate, I'm getting greater than that, man. I tell you, I'm struggling now. I think in someone's better to put that, put that in there, mate. Where can people uh, follow you and follow the podcast? I oh, really appreciate it, mate. It's just uh, on all social media, um, and it's just Brian Wood MC at Brian Wood MC on all platforms on social media. Um, definitely give that first podcast a listen. I mean, Jay, what an incredible, inspirational guy, and it's not for. I'm not, I don't, it doesn't interest me about the, the views or how many people I listen to it. I just think it's a great story for people to, when, when they feel that they're crying over spilt milk, you won't ever do that again after listening to that. I'll definitely listen to it, mate. I'll definitely listen to it. Listen, best of luck with everything. I really appreciate your time, and we will get the uh, podcast proper done soon. Excellent.